Tonight, um, we want to leave plenty of time for questions because we're interested in hearing what's on your mind and trying to answer those questions if we can. But I want to tell you um, a bit of the uh, very recent background what, that brings us to where we are today with the Christic Institute lawsuit. And also, uh, most importantly, I would like to tell you about some recent developments that uh, we are very, very enthusiastic about, developments that occurred in Costa Rica. But as you uh, may well know, the Christic Institute lawsuit was dismissed by a federal judge in Miami two working days before it was to come to court. We had been trying uh, to use the provisions of the racketeering influence corrupt organization laws to further the investigation about Lepenka. We had already determined in the original investigation that the bombing was an attempt to frame the Sandinistas, but was really carried out by a cell within the Nicaraguan Contras and was aided by the Central Intelligence Agency and agents of the CIA, Cuban Americans from Miami, a group of North American farmers in Costa Rica led by John Hull, with close ties to drug trafficking in the Medellin cartel. But we knew that there was still more to investigate, and we tried to use the racketeering influence corrupt organization laws to investigate that. The RICO laws, which we, were, which we chose, were chosen primarily because they give us great investigative powers. They gave us the ability to demand that certain documents, or any documents, from the defendants be turned over. So we could demand and use the powers of the court to get telephone records, financial records, travel records, uh, virtually anything. And we tried to exercise those powers, but the defendants almost universally just ignored our, our demands. They got letters, subpoenas issued by the court, and they just paid no attention to them at all. They just didn't show up for depositions. They didn't turn over barely anything. We got an insight into their thinking during that process when one of the key defendants, John Hole, it seems, asked his lawyer, Ed Smith, a lawyer from Indiana, to uh, whether he really had to do this. He obviously asked Ed Smith, uh, he said, I've received these subpoenas from the Christic Institute. They want all sorts of personal records. Do I have to do it? And Ed Smith went and wrote back to John Hole and said, well, according to the law, you have to give them everything they ask for. But in this particular case, we know the judge is on our side. And if you just give them one or two pieces of paper, that will satisfy the judge, and he won't do anything more. That'll, that'll be the end of it. And then Ed Smith, not being a real bright fellow, took that, envelope, took that letter and put it in the wrong envelope and mailed it to us instead of John Hull. <laughs> and, but even given that, and that kind of action on the part of all the defendants, the judge just refused to do anything. He refused to really force these people to put sanctions against them, refused to force them to abide by the rulings of his own court, by the laws of the United States. Yet the judge went and set a date for us to go to trial, and we prepared to go to trial. We were kicking and screaming, but we decided if we have to go to trial, even under these circumstances, we can still win. And then two days before the trial was to begin, he dismissed the whole thing. We appealed that. Uh, the judge, obviously, as you might already know, didn't like the fact that we appealed it, and he ruled that we were not only wrong in alleging what we had alleged, but we knew it was wrong and had acted fraudulently, and therefore we should have to pay the expenses of the other side as well as our own expenses. And he assessed those expenses at $1.2 million. And as you might well know, we appealed that, and according to the laws, we had to post a bond with the court equal to the amount of the judgment, and we made an appeal to people all over the United States. Many of you might have gotten it, and many of you, I think, helped. Thank you. And uh, we were able to raise that $1.2 million and go on. We know that that um, greatly upset the, uh, the defendants. They didn't expect us to do that. They thought that they had shut down the Christic Institute. They thought they had put an end to this. And uh, I know that they were shocked to find that we could raise that much money and go on. I know that because I was working on another story in Costa Rica, and I interviewed some high-ranking Costa Rican official. And uh, when I finished interviewing him, he said, oh, I just, um, 
was up in Washington and I heard someone mention your name. And I said, oh, who was that? Uh, what happened? And he said, it was, uh, I was talking to General John Singlow. And uh, he was very, very upset. He said he was really disturbed. He said that he was involved in some lawsuit that you were involved in. And the whole thing was finished. And then Jane finally gave you a million dollars and it's going ahead again. And, <laughs> and uh, that's just an insight of how these people think, their view of the world. They think that everything that's been bad since Vietnam is Jane Fonda's fault. And the truth is that um, Jane Fonda, you know, is sympathetic, but she didn't give any money to this. You did. And we thank you for that. Well, the case is on appeal, and it's going to be a long process. We don't think that we're going to get a decision from the appeals court until maybe September or maybe towards the end of the year. Then. We're going to have a new period of discovery, we hope, at this period in which we can really exercise the investigative powers that we have been seeking at the beginning. And that will be six to eight months. So we really are talking realistically about maybe having a trial next summer. That's a long way off. And it's a very difficult uh, time for us. It's difficult to sustain the support among the public. It's difficult to sustain the financial support we need, the financial base to continue investigating, to continue with all the legal work that needs to be done. And uh, it's difficult to keep up our enthusiasm, enthusiasm and the enthusiasm of the public. All that is, is, is difficult because it's a long time. But we've come to realize that the delay really has been a blessing because a lot of things have been happening, things that uh, we could never have dreamed would be happening. On the one hand, we've had plenty of time to continue with our investigation, and we are continuing vigorously with our investigation, and every day we're gaining more and more information and getting into a much, much stronger position. So much so that we are absolutely sure that the defendants are going to come to regret the fact that this was delayed in the first place. It would have been much, much better for them had we gone to trial a year and a half ago when the case was first thrown out. Uh, they are going to uh, certainly regret the fact that there was this delay and we had this additional time, especially because of events that have been occurring beyond our control, events with the, the Christic Institute and Martha and I had really nothing to do with. But in Costa Rica, gradually, slowly, the truth is coming out. The first thing that happened was that the Costa Rican parliament, the Congress, formed a commission to look into narcotics trafficking in the country. They came up with a very detailed report on the problem of narcotics trafficking, and their conclusion was that the problem of narcotics trafficking through Costa Rica did not exist before the arrival of the Nicaraguan Contras. That in the, in the early 80s, the National Security Council, Oliver North's gang, and the CIA worked to establish a so-called Southern Front for the Contras. They set up training camps, they recruited people, they built airstrips, and they set up all the logistics that were needed to supply the Contras on that Southern Front. And when they needed pilots to fly the planes to bring the arms to the Contras, they turned to their friend, General Noriega. General Noriega gave them drug pilots. And in a very short time, the planes that were coming bringing the arms to Costa Rica were being loaded up with cocaine and flown back to the United States. This I know you've heard from the Christic Institute, I know you've heard it from your local organizers here, but this is the Costa Rican parliament talking now. They said that this now, today, the Contras are gone, but the drug trafficking continues. And they made a recommendation, which by the way, just uh, two days ago was accepted by the entire Congress and had already been accepted by the cabinet and put into practice, they made a recommendation that because of this, that John Poindexter, Oliver North, Robert Owen, Richard Secord, John Hull, the former U.S. ambassador to Costa Rica, Louis Tams, and the former CIA station chief, Joe Fernandez, be banned for life from entering Costa Rica. And that has been done and in its effect today. The next thing that happened was that the Costa Rican police, who have shown something less than enthusiasm about pursuing this matter, uh, finally, in the face of overwhelming evidence, 
opened up an investigation about allegations that John Hole was involved in arms trafficking and drug trafficking. That investigation resulted in criminal charges against John Hole for arms trafficking and drug trafficking, and he was arrested. He spent several weeks in jail, and then, against the recommendation of many people who knew him and knew about his CIA connections, he was granted bail, and of course, immediately jumped bail and flew off to the United States. He's now in Indiana. The drug trafficking charge at the moment is in suspension. It was withdrawn. It's not dropped. It's suspended only because some documents have been submitted in English. And uh, the Costa Rican law is very specific that a very um, long, bureaucratically difficult process must be followed to translate English documents into Spanish and have them officially certified. And that now is being done, and certainly the charge for drug trafficking will be reinstated, but it will take several months to do so. The next thing that happened, and the most important thing, is that the Costa Rican Chief Prosecutor's Office, the um, equivalent of the Attorney General, except it's under the judicial branch of government, changed hands, and a new, honest, vigorous prosecutor took office. He ordered that a serious investigation of La Penca be carried out, and he appointed one of his prosecutors and two detectives to do that. He ordered them to not just investigate La Penca, but also investigate why La Penca wasn't investigated six years ago. The people that carried out this investigation knew very soon what they were dealing with, and they started never leaving the files in their office. Every night, one of the three would take them home and, or keep them in their car or keep them always in the possession of one of them. Last December, late in the month, they came out with their preliminary report. And the preliminary report said exactly the same thing that our investigation of the Lepenka bombing had said five years before. We, by the way, did not get involved in their investigation. We knew what was going on, but we decided that it was, if they did an honest job, they would certainly come up with the exact same conclusions that we had come up with, and it was best if we kept our distance, and it would be better for, for them and for us. So when they did do an honest job, they did come up with the same conclusions we came up with. They said that the, that the bombing had been carried out by agents of the Central Intelligence Agency, particularly John Hull, Felipe Vidal, a Cuban-American, and another defendant in the Christian Institute lawsuit, that the, a group within the Nicaraguan Contras had actually carried out the operation, that there were very close ties to drug trafficking and the Medellin cartel, and that played an important part in this. And in doing that, they used different sources than we had used. When we read their report, we were surprised because there were many names which we did not recognize. Some of our sources were actually rejected by them. They said they couldn't confirm the information that, uh, that these people gave. But they found other sources, often better sources than we had, because they actually had more power. They could subpoena people. We couldn't. So we were, of course, delighted by that. Also, by the way, they, they said in their report that the reason that the bombing had not been investigated in the first place was because the Central Intelligence Agency had bought off a large segment of the Costa Rican security services. More than 15 agents, intelligence and police agents, had been on the CIA payroll and were taking orders from the CIA and not from anyone in the Costa Rican government. So they recommended first-degree murder charges be filed against John Hull and Felipe Vidal and that a, some 20 or so Costa Rican law enforcement officials be charged with either illicit enrichment or dereliction of duty. In Costa Rica, a judge needs to actually bring charges, and a judge did review the uh, request for murder charges against Hull and Vidal and decided there was enough evidence to bring those charges, and he has approved those charges, and they are now in process. They are now official charges against these two people. The murder charge against John Hull forms the basis of an extradition request which has been prepared and is now sitting with the Costa Rican Embassy in Washington, and any day now will be presented to the State Department. We're not very sure that the State Department is going to receive it with enthusiasm, but um, nevertheless, we feel that we have at least John Hull in a very, very good position for us. Uh, we 
have him, if he ever should dare to come back to Costa Rica, or if, if legal processes should result in his return to Costa Rica, he faces murder charges. If he doesn't, he's going to come to court in our case and will have the enormous strength of saying that a country which is friendly to the United States, which in no way could be called a left-wing country, has run an honest investigation and decided that this person and others were responsible for the Lepenka bombing. So that's about the, uh, the best news I could possibly bring all of you who are uh, interested in this Lepenka matter and uh, the best news that we could possibly imagine. It's really a, an enormous gift. So we're very enthusiastic. We're very confident. We're confident that we're going to win the appeal. We're confident that events like have, have occurred over the past few months will continue to occur, that uh, the time is ripe for getting more and more information. But I know that many people feel this is getting a bit old. We're talking about a bombing that occurred in 1984, not, not 1989, by the way, May 30th, 1984. And it's old. We're talking about things that people still refer to as Iran-Contra related matters. It's somewhat old. It's, people are getting bored with it. But we don't view it that way at all. Martha and I are journalists because we feel, and we're journalists who live in the third world and report back to the first world, because we feel very strongly that to enforce democracy and to right the wrongs that exist in this country, the first step must be an informed public, that no social change is meaningful unless it comes from a mass movement and an informed public. We don't think that we can create that ourselves, but we think that in a small way we can contribute to that by being journalists. So public information is very, very important in our lives. And we view this Lepenka lawsuit as a perfect means for informing the public about how the covert organs of this government operate, what they do in our name. And we think that the Lepenka bombing is simply an example of that. We're sure that the CIA and other covert organs of this government have done many more horrible things in the past they're doing more horrible things right now. The problem is that we don't know about all of those things, and on none of them can we get a handle like the handle we have gotten on the Lepenka bombing. The Lepenka bombing brings us a unique opportunity, a unique opportunity to look in minute detail of what happened at the CIA's involvement, at the National Security Council's involvement, at the involvement of a whole range of people who have been subverting our Constitution and institutions that will continue to subvert our Constitution unless they're stopped. So we want to use this as an example, as a teaching thing. Not to say that this is the most important thing that ever happened. Not to say that this is, that the, what we suffered or the other victims of Lepenka are more important than what the people of numerous countries have suffered and continue to suffer. No, all those things are more important, but this is an example, an example that we can all use as a tool to educate the American public. And we intend to do that. We have started already, when I think now about the days when we first came upon this information and how isolated we felt, and we felt that just nobody was listening, and I think about now when there's really hundreds of thousands of people around the country that have joined this movement and become part of it, I really think that we have achieved much more than we ever thought was possible, even to this day. If everything stopped today, it would be a great victory. And when I think about what we're going to achieve in the future as we get closer and closer to trial and the public becomes more and more interested in this, more and more aware of it, and we activists seize upon the opportunities to educate the public, then we're going to achieve many, many times more victories than we ever thought was possible. So this is really an enormous opportunity and I thank all of you for coming tonight and showing your concern. And now is the moment when you can all be a part of this education. There's a great literature table in the back. I took a few minutes as I came in and looked at it, and the local organizers here have done a wonderful job of assembling and writing literature. There's videotapes, there's pamphlets. You should all take these things, show them to your neighbors, begin organizing, not in a spectacular high profile way, but person to person, door to door, block to block, and spreading the word and getting people activated. There's a lot of interest right now. There's a lot of interest about people being abused by the system. 
all the things that have been happening with the savings and loans, all the things happening with the economy, the refusal of the government to give the people the deserved peace dividend, the militarization surrounding the war on drugs, all of these have raised a high level of concern in the public, and all of you can work with us to try to seize upon that concern to build up more and more enthusiasm to bring these covert operations under control, to bring them to an end so that things like Lepenka don't happen again. So thank you, and I'll be available to answer questions after. Thank you. set me up, now I've got to perform, I guess. Um, I guess I ought to tell you how I got involved with acrystics. It had to do with just exactly what Bruce said. Uh, my hobby since the, the mid-70s when the three Rockwell managers from Anaheim, California were assassinated in Tehran was poking into their murders in my spare time. And I was running back and forth in the Middle East uh, on some security projects. And I was, uh, I was recruited into Ali North's network in uh, 1985. I had a, a small cargo airline. And um, I had uh, been taken to the State Department uh, by some covert operators and uh, was taken up on the hill uh, to a congressman's office where I was introduced to Rob Owen and uh, several other members of the uh, Iran-Contra scandal. Um, I had proposed being a conservative, right-wing, Oklahoma cop soldier that if the Congress approved uh, supplying uh, legitimate legal aid to the Contras, I would help them. Uh, specifically, the $27 million worth of, uh, of congressionally approved what they called humanitarian aid that they were going to supply in the fall of 85. Well, while I was submitting um, proposals to Rob Owen and to the State Department and uh, to certain congressmen on the Hill. I uh, started stumbling across uh, information that, uh, that weapons were being hauled to the Contras on airplanes um, and drugs were being brought back. And uh, that went against my I guess you'd call it naive sensibilities. Uh, I, uh, I reported this to the National Security Council <laughs> through, through Rob Owen. <laughs> and, uh, and I also discovered that those same airlines, these are, these little covert airlines are what I call tentacles of the octopus that we're all stumbling across, and the Lepinka bombing is part of it. Uh, I discovered that these uh, operators of these little airlines that were set up after Air America was sold off from the CIA in the late 70s uh, were hauling weapons to Iran. And this was right after um, CIA station chief in Beirut, uh, Bill Buckley, was, was uh, taken hostage and tortured to death. It was shortly after the 241 Marines were blown up in the Marine barracks in, in Beirut. And after the American embassy was bombed twice in Beirut and once in Kuwait. And it never registered in my Oklahoma mind that the U.S. government could be involved in this thing. 
what I thought was all of these maverick CIA covert operators were, um, were out of control and uh, were cheating the government and were hauling government-approved supplies to the Contras and to the Afghan freedom fighters um, and were diverting their airplanes and hauling weapons to Iran because I, I just couldn't conceive of members of the White House approving weapons to a designated terrorist state that was blowing up our airplanes and killing our soldiers and, and uh, taking hostages in the Middle East, the same people that had held our embassy for 444 days, the embassy where two of my three children held their high school graduation ceremonies. So I went to uh, Rob Owen, Ollie North, several congressmen, and, uh, and I said, hey, did you know that there's, they're using laundered drug money to supply the Contras and they're, they're diverting the airplanes to uh, Tehran with, uh, with weapons for the Ayatollah's government? And uh, I was very bluntly told to mind my own business because this was a highly classified national security covert operation. Well, I, uh, I didn't buy that. And I started raising hell on the hill. And I raised so much hell I talked myself out of their inner circle. And uh, they started a little disinformation program on me that said, well, old Wheaton must be a KGB agent or a Cuban DGI agent or he wouldn't be investigating these patriots. And uh, it was about that same time that I met Dan Sheehan, uh, January of 86. And he and I sort of were the odd couple, the, the liberal, intellectual Harvard lawyer and the, the uh, Grapes of Wrath Oklahoma country cop. But we hit it off, and, uh, and uh, we got along pretty good. And so we got together and uh, decided that we would try to help Tony and Martha out and look into this, this La Pinka bombing thing. Well, that led us in several different directions uh, on this, the tentacles of this octopus that I was talking about. And it kept leading me into little, little airlines, little covert airlines that were flying weapons around the world and, uh, and drugs in the United States and uh, laundered drug money being passed through savings and loans down in Texas. And I stumbled across an operation out in, uh, in uh, the Ozarks in Arkansas that was part of that Barry Seal operation, if you're familiar with it. Uh, Barry Seal was the one who owned the airplane that Hassenfuss crashed in, the C-123 that was shot down in Nicaragua. Uh, I stumbled across the paramilitary training of Latinos up in the hills of the Ozarks and out in some ranches in West Texas and the movement of weapons out there. And DEA stumbled across a drug smuggling operation interconnected with it, and three different DEA cases were opened and immediately closed, and the agents transferred. Um, <clears throat> While all of this was going on, this, this is a confusing thing, but if you look at all of these various incidents, and you can sort of see why I call it an octopus, because each one of these tentacles leads back to the same people. Um, I was so naive that in May of 1986, I briefed CIA Director Bill Casey on what these guys were doing. I said, sir, do you know what these guys are doing? <laughs> and he says, no. <laughs> and, and he says, I'll get right back with you. I've got to make an overseas trip, and I'll be right back. Um, I, uh, he didn't get back with me, but 
a mutual friend of ours went to dinner at his house on the night of the 24th of November, 1986, after the Iran-Contra thing broke. That was the night before Ed Meese announced they had found the documents uncovering the diversion from the Iran weapon sales to the Contras. Um, my friend went to dinner with Bill Casey at his home, spent four hours with him briefing him on what I had uncovered. And uh, to my friend's shock, instead of Casey saying, wow, we ought to do something about that, he said, maybe we had better discredit Wheaton. Uh, so that is how I, in a nutshell, got involved in, in the Lapenka bombing case and, and hooked in with uh, Dan Sheehan, whom I refer to as the leprechaun. Um, but as part of that, I stumbled across several little airlines, including one called Pan Aviation at Miami Airport, uh, illegally owned by a Middle East gunrunner by the name of Sarkis Sagan Elian, um, with the former head of Air America on his board of directors. Uh, another airline at Miami Airport called Arrow Air. Arrow is in bow and arrow. You have to excuse my Oklahoma accent. You might not understand the way I'm pronouncing it. And because of that, while I was still investigating assassinations, think of bombing, drugs for guns. Uh, last summer, I was approached by Dr. Doug Phillips and his wife Zona from uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, to ask them, they asked me to help them in a matter that they had a problem with, and that was the, that was the, um, the crash at Gander, Newfoundland on the 12th of December, 1985, that killed 248 soldiers coming home from peacekeeping duties in the Sinai and eight civilian crew members on a charter DC-8 owned by Aero Air uh, at Gander, Newfoundland. That airplane had originated in Cairo flown to Cologne, Germany, uh, refueled, flew to uh, Gander, Newfoundland, refueled again, was on the ground about 70 minutes, took off from Gander and about 19 or 20 seconds later lay in flames several thousand yards off the end of the runway with everybody on board dead, 256 people. That was the uh, worst aviation disaster in U.S. military history, including World War II. It was the worst civil air disaster in Canadian history. And it was the tenth worst aviation disaster in the world, in the history of the world. And because I had heard of Aero Air down, co-located in the same building complex with Sarkis Saganelian's Pan Aviation, which was one of the airlines that I had reported to Director Casey on as hauling guns to the Iranians, uh, weapons to the Contras, and drugs back to the United States. Um, I decided that there was probably a connection between it and several other of these covert airlines. What you've got to understand is in the late 1970s, the U.S. government ordered uh, the CIA to sell off Air America, and Air America was the largest airline in the world at the time, uh, operating Southeast Asia in the war in Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam. And Jim Cunningham, who was the head of Air America in Southeast Asia, was the man tasked to sell off the Air America assets. Uh, these men lobbied in Washington for deregulation of the airlines in the late 1970s so that when they brought these airplanes back from Southeast Asia and these tens of thousands of air crew members, air traffic controllers, mechanics, 
uh, all of the support people from Southeast Asia. They could come in in the late 70s and early 80s and set up little small airlines with airline deregulation to run their covert operations in the 80s. So that when they brought everything back from Southeast Asia, they could immediately go into Central and South America and continue to operate. Well, Pan Aviation was part of that. Aero Air was part of that. Um, when that airplane crashed, and it crashed at about 6.30 in the morning in December, and it was very dark in Gander, um, while it was still burning on the ground, Larry Speaks, White House spokesman, came out and stated that uh, it wasn't a terrorist act. It was probably icing on the wings. The FBI agent in Ottawa, the legal attache, uh, sent a report to Washington and to the media while the plane was still burning on the ground, stating the same thing. Where they got their crystal ball to be able to state it was icing on the wings, not a terrorist act, while it was still burning before they'd ever recovered any of the bodies is amazing to me. Uh, while the plane was still burning on the ground, Islamic Jihad in Beirut called the Associated Press and stated that they blew that plane up. Um, the White House chose to immediately disregard any theory of a bombing on that plane and not investigate it as a bombing. And the, the aircraft crash was never, ever, <coughs> excuse me, investigated as a, as a bombing act or a possible terrorist act or even as an accidental explosion. Uh, they stuck with that story of icing on the wings from day one uh, and we couldn't figure out why as we probed into this thing, particularly since we have the Royal Canadian Mounted Police reports from eyeball witnesses. There were at least four witnesses on the ground at Gander that saw the plane on fire and or explode in the air before it hit the ground. We've got at least 20 ground crew members who serviced that airplane, who had their hands all over it, who stated there was no icing on the wings and no requirement for de-icing the airplane. We've got the statements of the aircraft crew of the airplanes that took off just before and just after that airplane. Neither one of those planes had to be de-iced or had any problems with icing on takeoff. We've got autopsy reports on dozens of these young boy and girls' bodies that stated they inhaled lethal doses, some of them up to 400% of a lethal dose of uh, carbon monoxide and HCN, hydrogen cyanide, which comes from the burning materials inside an airplane, into their body fluids and tissues, um, and the w world's renowned pathologists have informed us, and we've done a lot of research on it, that you cannot absorb those materials into your body after death. We have the testimony from a, a world prominent pathologist in London that that means that there was an intense fire explosion on board that plane while it was in the air before those kids died. Um, the second or third head of the Canadian Aviation Safety Board, a retired Canadian Air Force General, who's the former deputy commander of NORAD, North American Air Defense Command at Colorado Springs, Colorado, which is a joint American, uh, U.S. and Canadian operation, uh, who was placed on the board two years after the crash, stated that since there was no fire or explosion, those young people must have lived up to five minutes after the crash to inhale those toxic fumes. The bodies they're talking about were totally dismembered, decapitated, 
open chest cavities, and nobody survived impact on that airplane. A group called the Sons of Zion wrote a letter to the U.S. ambassador on the island of Mauritius two weeks after the crash stating that a Middle East group blew up that airplane. To this day, the White House and the Canadian Aviation Safety Board have continued to say, we have no reason to suspect a terrorist act, and we accept the Canadian majority report that icing on the wings caused that airplane to crash. I think it's working. If you have any questions, I'd ask if you'd keep them brief as possible, direct them to either Tony or Gene or both. Um, Okay, she basically asked uh, what, what, what is propelling Iran and Syria to begin to release some of these hostages. Tony just volunteered me for this. <laughs> um, speculation, I'm not sure that anybody really knows right now, but uh, I suppose some of it has to do with Glasnost and our reassessing our relationship with Eastern Europe and the Soviets. A big, usually, an old CIA covert operator, in fact, the one who introduced me to the group on the Hill when I got recruited into their network, he's a very bright guy with two master's degrees and everything finished for his PhD except his dissertation, 30 years as a covert operator. He's a Louisiana country boy, but very smart. And he says, if you really want to know the truth about any of this stuff, in his vernacular, he said, follow the dollar. And uh, I would suspect that uh, uh, a, a lot of these uh, former marketeers for defense contracts, I think guys like Albert Hakim, Dick Secord, and various other people. Incidentally, Dick Secord, General Secord, sued me year before last for $6 million, uh, alleging that I called him a crook. Uh, <clears throat> in federal court in Washington, D.C. But uh, these guys uh, see big bucks in going back <clears throat> and rebuilding Iran's infrastructure. Um, the oil industry in Iran is chaotic uh, after the, the uh, Iran-Iraq war, and there's going to be, there's going to be big bucks uh, put into rebuilding both of those countries, their, their oil industry, their, uh, their military establishments, their uh, communications network, all of the basic national infrastructure of both those countries. And I would suspect that uh, the big motivation is uh, we see a chance to move back into the Middle East and reestablish contact with Iran, which I think we should have. Iran's going to be there forever, we're going to be here forever, and we need to get back and get some normalization of, re of relations. But from a real uh, practical standpoint, I'd say it's uh, a chance to get back in there and start uh, bringing in some of those petrol dollars into the United States. Let me just, uh, just add something to that. I, I agree with Gene that there's some, th these, these prisoners were not released um, certainly not released because of, of goodwill. There was, some, there was some deal made at some level. Uh, we can't be sure now uh, what it was, but we know that there's been, in this area, secret shipments of arms. That's, we don't know that there was one 
now, but that's something to look for. Just on the way down here, I heard on the radio that there was uh, were reports out of Israel that Israel was about to release uh, some prisoners of the Hezbollah that they are they are holding. And then there was a statement from Washington that said this has absolutely nothing to do with the release of the U.S. hostages. Well, we know from all the investigations that we've carried out that the U.S. Uh, so-called security agencies use Israel, Argentina, um, Brunei, or all countries all over the world as, as surrogates. So it's no, um, you know, wouldn't be out of uh, the realm possibility that the U U.S., while maintaining a position that they're not having any, making any deals, would just have Israel make the deal for them. I mean, that would be totally in keeping with, uh, with reality. I mean, you've said most, most of it, that's what you said is true. Uh, Michael Harari was a, uh, was and probably is to today, a, a key figure in all of this. He was a, uh, I, I don't think it, we should call him an ex-intelligence uh, operative for Israel. I think he maintained, uh, maintains today close connections to Israeli intelligence and was working hand in hand with General Noriega. He was a, uh, a very, very key figure in all of this because he had a hand in the uh, illegal supplies going to the Contras, arms supplies. He had a hand in uh, the drug dealing and the relationship between the two. And we and others were um, really interested when we, when we heard the news that the U.S. Army had announced that he had been arrested shortly after the invasion and uh, not terribly surprised when uh, they corrected themselves a day later and said, no, no, he, he hadn't been arrested. Actually, they said they arrested his chauffeur and had mistaken his chauffeur for, for him. So it's interesting that they would get, you know, I mean, that seems like a, a rather impossible mistake. But um, Michael Harari is certainly a, you know, a key figure in the center of all this. We'd love to talk to him. Um, we don't have that opportunity. And uh, maybe, well, we'll see how things work out. But he's, he's someone we, we are definitely concentrating on. Yeah, he was, uh, Ollie North was given about 1,200 hours of community work. Uh, General Secord, who has a Swiss bank account that he refused to disclose the contents of to the Iran-Contra Committee under the Fifth Amendment of self-incrimination, uh, uh, and they have several million dollars that they haven't accounted for yet, was given a $50 fine in this thing. Uh, the man who shipped the Hawk missile parts to Iran for them is languishing in a federal prison up in Sheridan, Oregon, and to bury him and keep his mouth shut, they gave him a 10-year sentence for, for obeying the orders of who he thought were the legitimate representatives of the United States government. So he's doing 10 years. Secord's got a $50 fine, Ollie's got nothing. Um, the reason Secord dropped his lawsuit against me is because as a plaintiff, he would have had to disclose all of those Swiss bank accounts that he refused to disclose to the Iran-Contra Committee. And on discovery, my attorney and I laid out all of 30 questions on his Swiss bank accounts. And Tom Green, his attorney, who was the one who helped Fawn Hall and Ollie take the documents out of the White House, Tom Green immediately ran back to my lawyer and said, 
let's drop the case. <laughs> so that's how that thing's done. Let me just add in that regard that if, if you take the principles in the Iran-Contra affair, all the people that have been um, prosecuted by the special prosecutor, and add together all the prison time for the total, total prison time that all of them got, it comes out to be far less than the two-year prison sentence received by the people who held up the banner in the hearings and said, why don't you investigate the cocaine? Uh, I have a question on the first question aside on the last question you answered. Who was the person who received the, the uh, tenure sentence up in uh, Washington? He, he's a Los Angeles businessman who is a Pakistani uh, by birth, but he's a U.S. citizen from Los Angeles. His name is Arif Durrani. Uh, you mentioned or in your introduction uh, and the earlier part of your speech, you were talking about the activity I'm not going to uh, uh, get too involved in elaborating on what Bruce said. I'll tell you how I got, I got involved in it. I, was, I had been the narcotics advisor to the Shah's government in the early 70s, Farsi linguist, and I had the Iranian and American security clearances. I retired from the army in 75 and went back to Iran as a cons consultant on counterterrorism as a civilian. Um, because of my background over there, the embassy sort of, sent, the State Department in Washington sent messages that I was coming over there as a civilian and I was a guy with a white hat and they could tell me all their secrets. And uh, I had a background in homicide investigations. And uh, on the morning of the 28th of August, 1976, these three Rockwell managers, Bill Cottrell, Bob Krongard and Don Smith were on their way to work at Doshintape Air Base, the headquarters of the Iranian Air Force, and their car was ambushed and they were all three machine guns to death. Uh, the embassy called me in on the investigation that night because of my background over there. And uh, uh, the next spring, I had gone down on Kish Island and I was putting in a police department for the Shaw in that luxury gambling resort island down there. And, and the next spring, uh, Bob Woodward was coming out with a expose on renegade CIA agent Edwin Wilson's uh, furnishing explosives and terrorist training to Colonel Gaddafi in Libya. Ed Wilson is now doing 52 years in a federal prison in Marion, Illinois. Uh, but Bob Woodward was coming out on, with that expose, which is what led up to all of these covert operators being fired in the late 70s because they were out of control. The man who was my predecessor, predecessor as director of security on the IBEX program had just come there from Libya. He had been working for Ed Wilson, a retired CIA explosives and, and weapons specialist. And uh, the CIA felt that he was going to be named in Ed Wilson's case and they did not want any further publicity on the IBEX program. So they gave him about 48 hours to get out of the country and they recontacted me at that time and asked me if I would take over as director of security. Well, for the next two years, my, I had three or four hats to wear over there, but one of them was keeping the employees alive for the rest of the tour. This was a billion dollar program. and. Uh, and they were going to close it down if there was any more assassinations. We had 150 American employees plus their wives and kids over there. So I got to poking into the Rockwell assassinations, and I have uncovered witnesses and documentation that, uh, that uh, Bill Cottrell went home on leave to blow the whistle on a diversion of funds off the IBEX program to another covert operation. And he, he refused to go along with it because he thought it was a criminal act, so he went home to blow the whistle. 
And he came home on a weekend and was murdered. The, he came home on a Thursday evening. Thursday and Friday is the weekend in the Muslim countries. So he came home on the weekend on Thursday. Friday would be the equivalent of our Sunday, and he was murdered Saturday morning on his way to work. And it just it appears that Don Smith and Bob Congar just happened to hitch a ride in the same car with him and got killed. Before he went home to blow the whistle on this thing, he left the last will and testament with, with a CIA representative in Tehran, stating that if, if anything happened to him while he was home on leave, uh, the CIA officer was to send a copy of the will and testament to his mother and another copy to his stepmother. That's what got me involved in poking into murders. There's a whole string of dead bodies all over the country. There's assassinations involved in all this whole Iran Contra thing like you wouldn't believe. I wasn't allowed to probe into any diversions on, in my job. I found documentation that Bill Cottrell left a memo for record saying why he was going home to blow the whistle, and I've got that. Um, General Secord was the chief of the Air Force section of the military advisory group in Tehran at the time, and Albert Hakim was the bag man on the, on the IBEX program. Uh, while this period of time, as soon as General Secord retired from the Air Force, he became Albert Hawking's partner. It's a, it's a complex thing, and it's awfully hard to explain in a short period of time. Actually, I'm going to defer most of this to, to Gene, because he knows more about it than I do. I, I have, um, what I know about it is, what I've read in the articles in the Houston Post and the, um, the Reader in Los Angeles, which had a, a summary of, of that article. And the work done by the Houston Post said that the that whack funds, secret funds of the CIA, had a, a great deal to do with the failure of more than 100 savings and loans associations in the state of Texas, and that the CIA had set up a whole network of uh, so-called proprietary companies, uh, companies that were part of what we have described in the Christa Consult lawsuit, um, off-the-shelf operations, operations that wouldn't be uh, directly connected or traceable to the CIA, but would be in the private sector, but still serving the interest of the CIA. And that these, um, these uh, proprietary companies had received billions of dollars in unsecured loans from savings and loans associations in Texas that were arranged by the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, that when a lot of the, uh, well, the Iran-Contra scandal and the Christic Institute lawsuit and the things that Gene has been talking about and all these things began to unfold, there was a great panic within the CIA that a panic that all of this was going to be discovered, these off-the-shelf operations were going to be discovered and dozens of these proprietary companies were just shut down. They were closed up. And all these loans were defaulted. And these banks were out billions of dollars. And that's the reason that hundreds of savings and loans associations in Texas failed. Um, it's a, a very, very interesting story. And uh, as far as I know, only the reader in Los Angeles has, uh, of the national press anywhere, has, uh, has picked it up. But Gene can tell more, more about it. Uh, while I was roaming through the Ozarks chasing these, uh, these uh, drug smugglers and Barry Seals airplane and tracking this stuff down into some of these ranches in Texas that I mentioned before, um, I stumbled across the use of some of these banks and savings and loans to finance these little covert airlines. And every time the airline wanted to close up shop and move someplace else, it would go bankrupt and leave the bank or savings and loan to collapse. Uh, and about 18 months ago, I sort of uh, hooked up with Pete Bruton, who's a journalist for the Houston Post. He's the one that's been writing these articles. He started writing a series of articles starting about the 4th of February, 
if you want to get him, uh, there's, there's, I think he's written six or seven. He's been in Washington and New York last week uh, briefing people on him. Uh, as a result of Pete's uh, articles, and we document, we've tracked some of these airplanes back coming in from Australia, uh, coming into Texas, Arkansas, and particularly a, one of the first banks that collapsed was a bank called Indian Spring State Bank in Kansas City. And uh, it was financing a thing called Global Aviation. Global Aviation was a covert operation hooked in with Tom Kleins, if you remember him in the Iran-Contra affair. Uh, Tom Kleins was Ed Wilson's partner. Tom Kleins and a group of these covert operators back in the late 70s had formed a company called Eatsco, Egyptian American Transport Company. And they were shipping military equipment by ship to Egypt and ripping off the Pentagon by double billing them on it. They were caught and given a $100,000 fine and allowed to keep the $40 million or so that they skimmed off. And we found that, and we tracked through a paper trail that they had an airline too, and the airline was this global aviation that resulted in the, uh, the collapse of the Indian Spring State Bank. Well, when that bank collapsed and global aviation disappeared, the planes disappeared, and they showed up at Miami Airport. You know, they repaint them, uh, re-register them, and create another company. The way these covert operators work, when one of their companies collapses, goes bankrupt, gets involved in a scandal, the media gets onto it, they simply go bankrupt and, like he said, leave the savings and loan or the bank that financed them to take, the, to take their lumps. And the guys simply fly off into the wilderness and, and open up another file drawer, pull out the name of another company, re-register the planes with another name, and continue to operate. And they went from Kansas City to Florida, and now I was tracking one C-130 plane that came out of Australia up there in Mena, Arkansas, and after I got onto it and they found out I was tracking it, in a three-month period of time, they changed ownership three times on that airplane. But it all tracked back to the same lawyer's office in Miami, Florida. Um, and that's sort of how it's done. Pete Bruton has done a super job on this. He's been chasing a guy by the name of Walt Misher and uh, Robert Corson and Robert Corson's mother, B.J. Garman, and they all appear in his articles. And uh, I've been down to Houston and, and shared documents with him. And I can tell you that, that he's got them uh, by the tail. As a result of his articles, a congressional committee invited CIA Director Webster to come and testify to what he wrote in his Houston Post uh, exposés, which are still going on. And Judge Webster politely declined to go up here before the committee. That's where it sort of stands right now. Um, actually, I, I've been now just finishing the second week of a three-week speaking tour for the Christie Institute, and that is the one question that is uh, asked every single night, uh, every single time. There's, um, why isn't the press covering these things? And um, if I can take a few minutes to answer this, because it's a, it's a complex situation. I think that the... Uh, that the reason basically stem is, has an economic base. That uh, with television and newspapers, but particularly with television, in the last five or six years, every one of the major television networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, has been bought by a large corporation that doesn't give a damn about journalism. They are what we call in the 
uh, news business bottom liners, they're business people. And they've come to view the evening news in the same light that they view situation comedies. They think how much it costs to produce and how much it brings in an income. And there's an effort, a, a demand, to reduce the expenditures and increase the income. So you get enormous economic restraints being put on the people in the news divisions. You get um, pressure to cover the cheap kinds of news stories, the stories that don't cost anything, and they are the news conferences. If you look at the news now and think and try to remember what it was like 10 years ago, there's now an awful lot more cheap stories, news conferences, one-day stories, one-hour stories, where you just take a, a camera crew, send them to somewhere, some office in Washington, get the president or somebody else making a statement and put that right on the air with uh, nothing else. There is no money to do the kinds of stories that we've been talking about tonight with the arms shipments, the drug shipments, the gander crash, those, those kinds of stories cost money. They take more than an hour to cover, and there's a great reluctance to cover them. But a more important factor in my mind is that when these corporations took over the news divisions, they made cutbacks not just in, in operating budgets, but also in personnel. In all three networks, in the last four years, 20 to 30 percent of the total personnel have been fired. They're just out on the streets, and there's no jobs for them to go to. If they want jobs, they have to go to local television or go to some other industry. There's no more jobs in the, in the networks. Those people that are left are scared. They're scared for good reason. They feel they're in a very, very tenuous situation. They know that if they cover a story, like the stories we've been talking about tonight, that there's a very well-organized right wing, much or better organized than the left in this respect, that has organizations like AIM, Accuracy and Media, that might well launch a letter writing campaign and flood the network with hundreds, maybe thousands of letters. It happened to CBS a few years ago, and uh, they're seriously scarred to today. But they could flood the network with hundreds and thousands of letters protesting. And this person who is making a decision thinks, well, if I do make the assignment, if I do cover the story, and there's a reaction, and lots of letters come, and there's a right-wing mood in the country existing now, then I might lose my job, and I'll be out on the street. If I don't assign this story, no one's going to come to me and say, why didn't you uh, cover the Lepenka bombing, or John Hole's trouble, or the Gander air crash? That, that's just not going to happen. So the safe thing is to do nothing, and that's unfortunately what happens. The, the lessons, I think, that, that this means for all of us are that, first of all, it's, it's not a total blackout, it's a virtual blackout, but there have been little cracks in the wall, there have been little successes from time to time. Gene managed to get an excellent piece on ABC's 2020 about the Gander air crash, there's a few more things in the works. A few months ago, the New York Times had an excellent story about John Hole's trouble and the Christic Institute lawsuit. It was, it was really good, but that's one story in six years. The uh, Washington Post had one story in six years recently as well, the Miami Herald the same. So there are occasional little cracks in the wall, and we ought to be pushing for those cracks. We ought to be pressuring both the television and newspapers on a local level and on a national level. We ought to be calling them. We ought to be asking them why they're not covering these things. When they do cover them, we ought to call them and congratulate them, say this is, this is excellent, this shows excellent bravery. But for our own information, for the information that we need to go out and organize, that we need to go and talk to our neighbors, we have to change our habits. We've got to get out of the habit of expecting to find these things on the evening news or the morning newspaper. They're just not going to be there. There are going to be little cracks in the world, little successes from time to time, but it's not going to be enough to keep us informed. For our information, we need to begin to support and turn to the alternative media. There's now a situation which exists that's much different than the situation 10 years ago when there was not enough information. Now it's quite the opposite. There's a flood of information. There's more information available than ever before. It's just in a different place. And we have to start turning to things like PeaceNet, for instance, which I'm very enthusiastic about. And it's a computer network. And it has a fantastic amount of information, up-to-date information, up-to-date hour by hour, on peace and social justice issues and ecological issues, 
and it's all available to anybody that subscribes to it if you have a computer and a modem. And if you don't, find somebody who does and get this information and spread it around. There's radio, alternative radio. I think the Pacifica Network is doing the best job in the country right now. And uh, KPFA and others that you can get here in Seattle are, are reporting this kind of information. There's a number of alternative newspapers and you ought to be turning to those and supporting those and we ought to be supporting this alternative media, the media to get our information at the same time that we pressure the, the mainstream press to break this blockade that they've established. We, we just moved. <laughs> I can answer this question very quickly. I, I've been so wrapped up in certain tentacles of this octopus that I never have gotten involved in the, uh, in the Ethiopian investigation, and uh, nothing has ever come to my attention that there's any relationship between the two, but I'm not saying there isn't. I just don't know anything about it. Okay. Is it, is it, am I close enough now? Okay. Uh, I, I w I've been so involved in these other tentacles of this octopus that I never got involved in the Ethiopian investigation at all, and I, I don't have any knowledge one way or the other whether, whether it might be related. investigating this for the families of the dead soldiers. It's a group called Families for Truth About Gander. For Truth About Gander. Yes, Families of the Dead Soldiers. And it's not to sue anybody, it's to, it's to force a legitimate investigation which was never conducted on this. You've got to, you've got to understand that that under international civil aviation regulations, ICAO regulations, the International Civil Aviation Organization's headquarters is in Canada, and it's a United Nations organization. It requires the, the country where an incident, where a crash occurs, to investigate the crash, but it does not prohibit the country where the majority of the victims are from, or from where the aircraft is registered, to conduct its own independent investigation. And if you take into consideration this was an, a U.S. manufactured airplane, U.S. insured, U.S. flagged and registered, all U.S. crew, all U.S. passengers, and all of the passengers were U.S. government employees, it is, it is totally outrageous that the U.S. government claims to not want to conduct an independent investigation. We have a 280-page blanked-out FBI report that they refuse to release under the Freedom of Information Act. They claim they did not conduct any investigation. The fact is we have documentation, government documentation, that will show that if they had conducted an investigation of this crash, they would have tracked back Aero Air to the Iran-Contra operation in 1985, a year before it ever became public. And, and that's what we're trying to do is just resolve the thing. We can prove the plane blew up, we just don't have a court to take it to. What we want the government to do is run a proper investigation to determine whether it was blown up by terrorists and they allowed the terrorists to go free, or if it was blown up 
by some sort of an accident. Now, we have documentation and, in, and information from eyewitnesses that those aero air flights were packing law anti-tank missiles into the cargo holes and siphoning them out of the, out of the Sinai to take to the Contras, which is in violation of all international civil aviation regulations on flying a passenger flight with what they call hot cargo on it. Hot cargo is anything that is flammable, explosive, that can be placed on a plane, and when it's placed on a plane, there's no passengers can fly on it. And yet they're smuggling weapons out of the Sinai to take to the Contras on these airplanes. So the plane was either endangered by placing explosives on a plane with, civilian, with, with passengers on it, the only time military people can even fly on a plane with explosives on it is when they're going into combat. If they're flying as passengers, totally prohibited. And so the plane either blew up accidentally because of those explosives that were being hauled in the belly of that airplane, or it was a terrorist act to punish Ollie North and crowd for shipping them the Hawk, wrong Hawk missiles. Keep in mind, this was also less than 60 days after the Achille Lauro incident where Ali and crowd got, you know, after Leon Klinghoffer was killed and thrown over the side of the Italian cruise ship, they scrambled the F-14s and forced down the Egypt airplane in Italy and captured the terrorists. These guys had dozens of reasons to target Aero Air. And I might mention, the year before, if I didn't mention it before, the year before this plane blew up. The director general of the multinational force, a retired U.S. State Department officer by the name of Lamont R. Hunt, was assassinated in Rome by a Middle East-backed group who opposed the Camp David Accords, which is what this multinational force was over there enforcing. So when they said they had no reason to suspect a terrorist act, this airplane, this very airplane that blew up, was targeted as a terrorist target, and the multinational force that was coming home had been briefed on the ground in Egypt to watch out for a possible terrorist act, and yet the White House says we have no reason to suspect a terrorist act. Um, you know, I think, I think that local groups, local organizing groups, have to make decisions based on the resources available to them and what they, you know, how they want to use those resources. I mean, you well all know very well you can't just ask people to go out and have demonstrations about everything. You just can't get, uh, you know, people just don't have the time or the energy to do that, and it takes a lot of resources to organize an event. That's one event, I mean, picketing a local television or newspaper is one event that's not going to pay off. I mean, you're not going to have a victory out of that. Um, it might be good in a hopeless case to, to make a point, but um, it's not going to be, you're not going to get something in the paper because you did that. I think it will make them, you know, uh, a little more stubborn. Um, but uh, you just have to make a decision based on your, your local, um, the local conditions, and uh, the, I, I would think there might be other, uh, you know, points that you'd want to pass a message to the general public about. I mean, other things like institutions of the government or um, institutions of the army, which are the armed forces, which you have plenty around here. And, but you have to make decisions about, you know, about what kind of local reaction you're going to have. I think people here in San Diego have a, a peculiar uh, situation. The peace movement here has a situation is different than a lot of other places in the country. So it's, it's really a, a local decision, and, um, but, but it's not one that, it's not a, the kind of thing where you're going to put up a picket line and, and win a victory. I'm a resident of Costa Rica, but I'm a citizen of the United States, and I've lived there for the past 
eight years. And we live in Costa Rica. I, I, yes, our family is in Costa Rica. I live in Costa Rica. He's in Patoka, Indiana. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Slim. <laughs> the, um, yeah, the, the question was, what are the chances? Do we know where he is? Um, yes, we know where he is. Um, what are the chances of an extradition? I would say Slim. The, um, aside from the... Um, you know, the, the obvious reluctance of the United States to have this person appear on the stand anywhere and testify. Um, aside from that, there's a, the key problem in, in John Hall's extradition is a uh, situation concerning his nationality. One year after the Lepenka bombing, John Hall took out Costa Rican citizenship. To do that, he had to renounce his U.S. citizenship. And that renunciation is on file with the Costa Rican government. The U.S. government has been informed of that renunciation. The, in the eyes of Costa Rica, John Hall was a Costa Rican citizen, and they're proceeding with the extradition on that basis. If he was a Costa Rican citizen, there'd be absolutely no problem in having him sent back to Costa Rica for trial. However, the U.S. has taken the position so far that they do not recognize that renunciation, and they still consider him to be a U.S. citizen. Uh, curiously enough, um, uh, two months ago, or a little less than that actually, um, some friends of John Hall and a, and a um, publicity agency sent out notices that Hall was going to have a news conference in, in Washington at the National Press Club uh, to announce the beginning of a lawsuit against, quote, those people who were harassing him, which we assume to be us. Um, Many people ask, well, John Hull's going to sue you. What are you going to do? And we, we said, that's great. You know, we've been trying for years to get this guy in court. If he, you know, if he pulls it in, us into court, that's, that's wonderful. That would be, that'd be fantastic. Well, Hull didn't show up for the news conference. His friends did. They would not be at all specific about uh, who was going to be sued, when they were going to be sued, why they were going to be sued. They just said he's going to sue some people. And um, they issued a statement, which they said came from Hull. And that statement, um, among other things, had a curious paragraph in which he complained. He said that the U.S. government is now harassing me for having dual citizenship, and the only reason that I took out Costa Rican citizenship was because the CIA ordered me to do so. So that's, um, that's interesting. So. I think that the, the fact that uh, Noriega is in a U.S. prison has um, surprised and put the U.S. government in, a, in an awkward situation. I think that the, uh, that the idea of having him in custody in the United States, alive in the United States, is the last thing that the United States had on its mind when it invaded Panama. Uh, that was clearly not the plan, and it was only, um, you know, uh, the, the fact that he successfully managed to get into the Vatican Embassy and all that happened after that, that he is alive. And I think that presents the United States with a very, very awkward problem. Um, one of the problems, or not the least of those problems, is the fact that the best witnesses against Noriega, and, and let me start this by saying I fully believe that General Noriega was heavily involved in drug trafficking, and uh, there's overwhelming evidence that indeed he was. Uh, we have that evidence. We, we are using in the Christic Institute lawsuit half a dozen pilots who flew drugs with arms and many of them had a close connection to General Noriega and they presented testimony about that. The problem for the U.S. government is that these best witnesses against Noriega are people that are also witnesses in our case and the U.S. government has already said they are unreliable. These people can't be believed. They said that they can't be believed because they're, they're drug traffickers. Well, of course they're drug traffickers. I mean, if you, you know, who's going to testify about drug trafficking but drug traffickers? And if you go, you know, if you go to, to any local court, you know, here tomorrow, go to a local court and look for a drug case, 
the people that are going to be testifying are going to be drug traffickers. They're going to be people involved in drug trafficking, and that's, that's what happens in all drug trials. So the U.S. Is in, a, uh, is in a difficult situation, and there's, there's no doubt that General Noriega has a, an enormous amount of information about U.S. intelligence activities, uh, information that the United States would not like to have revealed. There are many rumors and speculation that George Bush has information, or that General Noriega has information about George Bush. Um, I, I really don't know, and I don't know how we can be sure of that or not. We can, we can say it's, it's logical, he probably does, but the, um, the, the problem with that is, if he has information about George Bush, it's only valuable, it can only be used by him to pressure the United States government if he doesn't reveal it. Once he does reveal it, it has no value whatsoever. It just is, is a one-shot thing and he loses its value. So it's only, it's only of value to him if he keeps it to himself. If he does have such information, it certainly hasn't served him well so far. I mean, after all, he's, you know, he's been invaded and arrested and he's in, in jail. So we'll just have to see what, um, what uh, transpires. But I think that the arrest of Noriega has put the United States government into a, an awkward situation. Getting back to George Bush, um, we, all I can say is that we will pursue the Christic Institute lawsuit and the Christic Institute investigation to the highest levels possible, and we can promise you that. Um, that was the idea behind instituting the lawsuit, as I mentioned before, to use the powers of the court to further the investigation, and we have always said that the, what we know about the Lepenka bombing and the related activities is about the bottom of the, of, of the network. And we are carrying on this operation to move higher and higher to the highest levels possible, and we promise you we will. Um, obviously, as it gets higher and higher, it gets to be more difficult. I personally think that George Bush has been a, um, a clever person. He hasn't left a lot of fingerprints. Um, we, at the time that the case was thrown out, were in the process of uh, taking a deposition from his national security advisor, Donald Gray. There was a question of um, some documents which Gray refused to turn over, and our lawyers, the Christian Institute lawyers, went to a judge in Washington to get an injunction to force him to turn it over, and at that moment the case was dismissed and we lost that power. That will certainly be one of the first things we take up when we get that that power back, and um, if we had more on George Bush, I promise you that that would have been a major topic of my, my talk tonight. <laughs> You know, I think, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not terribly familiar with the, the details of the National Security Act or the uh, legal responsibility the president bears, but if, um, if any of you saw the uh, New York Times of yesterday in the Sunday magazine, there was an article by Seymour Hirsch about uh, what went on with the uh, House and Senate Iran-Contra committees and how they had decided that they would suppress any information that implicated the president because that would be too much of a shock for the country. And they did. They proceeded in such a way as to, to not pursue and to cover up information that implicated the president. Um, I think that's the attitude of, of people in Congress. I don't think that we can count on, on Congress to uh, willingly uh, change the National Security Act or to do away with the, the CIA or the National Security Council or these other covert organizations. I personally agree that they, they need to be not just controlled but abolished. There's no, there's no need for them. A foreign policy that respected other peoples of the world, there would be no need for covert activities. And there's... But, as, but we have to remember it's Congress it's those people that are in Congress that created this situation. It's those people that 
let it continue. There are congressional so-called oversight committees that don't do a damn thing. They don't do anything to control the CIA, nothing at all. And I don't think that we can put our faith in Congress to do that. I think that's why we have to build a movement. It has to become an issue in the country, and the only way the politicians are going to act is if they see a movement built in this country. We have to demand that they act, but they won't act out of, uh, out of, out of goodness or any, anything like that. They'll have to see, the movement will have to start with the people. In the beginning, Doug and Zona Phillips never even got involved in this. They almost died because their son died in this airplane crash. Zona went into seclusion. Doug sold his boat and motor home. Doug is a pathologist in Florida. <clears throat> they got a new lease on life after December of 1988, three years after the crash, they finally came out with the majority report. And the minority report that I told you about came out and said that there was a fire or explosion on board. And the minority members of the Canadian Aviation Safety Board uh, got in touch with Doug and Zona Phillips and told them that there was cover-up and that they didn't want to be any part of it. One of the members of the board resigned. Uh, uh, they changed chairman of the board twice. And that pulled Doug and Zona out of their deep mourning and lethargy, and they became angry. And uh, just this last year, the spring of 1989, is when they started, they went to Canada and talked with the prime minister and met with the parliament and uh, with Canadian journalists. This thing has received tremendous news coverage in Canada constantly that it hasn't received in the United States. The Pentagon refused to release a casualty list of survivors to them so that we could track down the families. So we've had to track down the families on our own. And as time goes along and each one of these news accounts comes out, more members of the families of the dead soldiers have contacted us. I think we have, of the 248, I think we have about 150 of them now. We still haven't tracked them all down, but I'm get, even I, and I'm, you know, I'm just sort of an outsider helping them. I'm getting letters from some of the families now, and each week we're receiving new information. Uh, more people are coming forward and furnishing us documentation, whistleblowers that were involved in the peacekeeping force, former intelligence officers, and we're, we're building up a case by, by the day. Really, it's, it's a staggering thing right now. Uh, a few months ago, very little was known by a lot of the families. They had sort of done like Doug and Zona had done, given up, crawled off into a hole, and wanted to forget the world. 
and now they've, uh, I've just within the last 48, 72 hours received letters from widows of two or three young soldiers, I'm talking about 21-year-old kids, stating that uh, they had given up on everything and didn't know what to do, they didn't feel any power, they didn't think anybody else in the world cared, and uh, they were sending Doug and Zona and thank you notes for uh, for persevering and getting this thing out in the open. And uh, and uh, right now it's just starting to mushroom. If you ask me what people could do out there in the community, it would be right to your congressman because the Congress is getting heat on this right now on why there was no U.S. investigation of this thing, why all these unanswered questions, and... Uh, and why should we allow the deaths of 256 Americans to remain a question mark totally in the hands of a foreign country when we truly have the capability and the legal authority to conduct an investigation? The only thing I can tell you is no investigation was conducted. They they refused to subpoena the witnesses before the Canadian Aviation Safety Board that had the evidence. They refused to subpoena the people who saw the plane blow up, who serviced the plane on the ground, saw that the, there was no icing on the wings. And now with, with this national media attention, the White House is starting to twitch. And uh, the more congressmen that get a little iron put in their back bones by letters from their home districts about the Gander thing, the more, the sooner we'll have some action on it. That's what we're going for right now. I think when we look at the activities of the CIA, we don't have to, um, we shouldn't just concentrate on the so-called Nicaraguan elections. I mean, the CIA has been heavily involved in Nicaragua over the last 10 years, and in the entire U.S. policy in Nicaragua over the last 10 years. And what happened in the elections was a, a victory for the policy of low intensity warfare. I mean this is something that the you know people have been writing about for some time and it's been on a kind of a theoretical level but in Nicaragua it has been successful and low intensity warfare is a is a theory that is actually has a there's been some military people who have re recently written that it's it's misnamed it's not a low level of warfare it's just a spreading out of of warfare to use political economic social and military means to destroy a government. And this is exactly what happened in Nicaragua and it worked. And I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a serious uh, danger for other parts of the world and for U.S. Po foreign policy that those practitioners of low intensity warfare will now use Nicaragua as, a, as an example of how this, this policy works and it will be happening more and more, and we ought to be, you know, in the real lookout for that. The fact is that the, you know, we know the results of the election in Nicaragua. Personally, I, part of me feels that what happened in Nicaragua, you know, was, was positive, should be viewed as a victory, that it was an enormous step forward for all of us to end the war in Nicaragua and to end the, end the economic boycott. And that's a big victory. It's a victory for the Sandinistas, it's a victory for the peace movement, it's a victory for 
everyone in Nicaragua. And it was an absolutely necessary step. It wasn't, um, in my mind, very useful, very much good to be able to continue to have a government in Nicaragua or for people in the United States to wave red flags or talk about revolutionary or anti-imperialist slogans when there was no food on the table. It didn't do any good to have a, uh, a, a wonderful uh, health care system when there were no band-aids or no bandages in the, in the health centers or a wonderful education system when there were no books or pencils. I mean, it just, uh, the level of suffering of the people of Nicaragua was just unacceptable and there needed to be a change. And that change has come about now. And the Frente Sandinista will certainly use these next five years for analysis of what they did right and what they did wrong in, this, in these last 10 years. And they still are the strongest single party in Nicaragua, and I think will emerge from this five-year period much stronger than they are today and are still a, an important factor in Nicaraguan life. On the other hand, the downside of what's happened in Nicaragua is the Contras and the question of the disarming of the Contras. And that's a real serious problem. There are people in Nicaragua, some people within the government and many people without, outside the government, who are coming back from Miami, who are Somosistas. They are the people who were in the government, the, the power structure, the class that supported the dictatorship of Anastasio Somoza. These people have come back now, and these people would like to use the Contras as a death squad, as an armed squad, and it doesn't take 10,000 Contras, it can be done with hundreds of Contras, but to use what, as many of the Contras as they can as a death squad to make sure that when elections come around in five years' time, that there are no Sandinistas left. They want to eradicate Sandinismo from Nicaraguan soil. And of course, that would be a, a, a tremendous bloodbath. And I think that Violeta Chamorro, who I you know, know very well, I've interviewed her often, I've talked with her you know, for many years, who I don't think is a terribly capable politician, I think she's acting absolutely correctly. I think she's acting in the, in the best interest of Nicaragua in her insistence that Humberto Ortega remain the head of the army for this period because he is the only person, the, he and the other leaders of the Frente Sandinista have been fully cooperating with the transition. They've been acting in a very, very principled manner and helping the transition. And there is no one except Humberto Ortega who could manage the uh, demobilization and reduction in the size of the Nicaraguan army, which is a, a, necessary, a necessary step. He's the best one to carry that out. If the, the army is, of course, reluctant to demobilize as long as the Contras remain armed. And I think that Chamorro understands that fully, and what I don't understand is what, what in the world people in Washington could possibly be thinking when Bernard Aronson goes and says that the USA, promised USA to Nicaragua will be jeopardized if you keep Humberto Ortega as the head of the army. I mean, that's just a, a policy that is leading towards a bloodbath, and it's, it's just in, incredible. It's a bloodbath that would not serve, I, I don't understand how it could possibly serve U.S. interests or interests of anyone. But I think that really is the, the, the big hurdle that Nicaragua is facing right now and the, the big um, cloud of doom on the future of, of Nicaragua. Could, could I add to him just a second here? Let me volunteer one thing. I have been closely associated with the CIA from the military side for many, many years. And I have many friends. I'm a retired chief warrant officer in the United States Army. I've served in the Marine Corps, the Air Force, and the Army. The power elite who practice and advocate low-intensity conflict, low-intensity warfare, covert operations in peacetime are a minority in the Pentagon and the CIA. The mat vast majority of the bureaucrats in the Central Intelligence Agency and the career military men in the Pentagon do not agree with this philosophy and they want it stopped, but they are, they are career bureaucrats 
before they are patriotic enough to stand up. They're afraid of these guys. The lunatic fringe is in control among those folks. And they're in power positions, and the people who object to it simply are sitting back waiting to draw their pensions so they don't jeopardize their careers. But, uh, but it's not the majority in either the military or the Central Intelligence Agency who, who go along with these covert operation things. The, the majority of the bureaucracy in the Central Intelligence Agency believes that the Central Intelligence Agency should be collecting intelligence and analyzing it, not going out destabilizing countries that we have diplomatic relations with. And the majority in the Pentagon believe it's there to protect this nation as a fighting force in times of world war or our country in national jeopardy, but they're afraid to speak up because this, what I call, again, the lunatic friend, Charles Manson in a three-piece suit with 30 years experience, is in charge. And, and these guys, they would jeopardize 30-year careers if they really spoke up on this matter. Uh, with a, lot of, with a lot of American support behind them, they might speak up. combination of the selling off of Air America in the late 70s and the, the firing of over 800 covert operators in what they call the Halloween Massacre in October 1977 resulted in covert operations going outside of the Central Intelligence Agency. This network, this old boy network of fired covert operators, and that include you got to remember that when Ed Wilson went to, became a fugitive and when he was convicted, uh, many, many folks, including Ted Shackley and Tom Kleins, were forced to retire from the Central Intelligence Agency. Dick Secord was going to be prosecuted in the Pentagon, refused to take a polygraph exam, and was forced to retire. The man who protected him at the assistant secretary level was Frank Carlucci at the time who resigned from the government. Uh, all of these guys who felt that they were the super patriots uh, decided in the 1979-80 time frame to support a very conservative right-wing uh, party so that they could come back in and take control. Now, I can tell you from personal knowledge that although they have protégés and supporters and political appointees inside the Pentagon and inside the Central Intelligence Agency and inside the National Security Council, the guys who are running these covert operations are not current career civil service CIA officers. They're ex-officers who are, who are sort of a shadow intelligence organization overlapping the Central Intelligence Agency. And yes, they were behind lobbying in Washington for deregulation. For the, there was a lot of cover reasons for it, but so that they could place these airlines in operation after the elections of, 19, of November 1980 and the taking on of the new administration in January of 1981. And that's when they all went into operation. Priest, so, and he's deeply involved in this, so you're the expert on that. 
Okay, I want to thank you and uh, for coming, and I'd like us to give uh, Tony Avergon and Gene Wheaton a round of applause.